Okay, in today's video, we're going to be going over an explanation and a derivation for the equation we use to find the Bohr radius in a hydrogen atom. And really quick here, the definition of the Bohr radius, the Bohr radius is the physical constant, and it's important to remember that it's approximately equal to the most probable distance between the nucleus and the electron. Uh, it's named after Bohr, Niels Bohr, because it was his role that he had in finding the Bohr model of the atom. And remember, it's the approximate, the approximately equal to the most probable distance, because we now know that electrons don't go around in circular orbits. Now they exist in like electron clouds or orbitals, but this is the most probable distance for one of the electron clouds for the electron from the radi from the nucleus of a hydrogen atom. Okay, so here we have our hydrogen atom, positive nucleus, negative electron. The electron is going around that nucleus, and in this place, at this point, its velocity is pointing in that direction. Now, what we want to do is we want to find the Bohr radius, the distance from the proton out to the first ground state, which we call N1. We're going to find that distance, R, the Bohr radius, and we're going to do that by knowing that this is a positive charge and this is a negative charge, and that the force on those charges is equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. So in one case, we could say we have the, uh, the electric force, and then in the other case, we have an, another electric force, which we can calculate as the centripetal force. And those two forces point in equal, uh, have equal magnitude, but point in opposite directions. And we're going to use that to now calculate the Bohr radius, because we know the electric force can be calculated as K Coulomb's constant. This is being Coulomb's law. Uh, K Coulomb's constant times one of the charges times the magnitude of the other charge divided by the distance between them. Then we can calculate the centripetal force and I like to just start off with Newton's second law, F equals ma. If something is going in a circular orbit, then we know the acceleration is v squared over r. We can substitute that into this equation and then we get this is the centripetal force is m v squared divided by r. And we said that these two forces are equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. So I can set these two equations equal to each other and we get that k times q1, q2 divided by r squared is equal to mv squared over r. Now, we can cancel out an r and an r, and then we're left with ke squared divided by r, mv squared. Now, what I did was this q and this q, they're equal to e, so we have e squared. e is the elemental charge, and we know that a proton and an electron, the magnitude of their charge is the same. The proton is positive, the electron is negative, but they're both 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So instead of having EE or Q1 and Q2, I put in here E, that's the symbol for the elemental charge. And you get K E squared divided by R is equal to M times V squared. Now, we're gonna leave this equation alone for just a moment. Because we know we're going to solve for r, but we don't know what v is. But we know that that electron has angular momentum. The angular momentum is L. That's a symbol for angular momentum. It's equal to m, the mass, times v, the velocity, times r, the radius, times the sine of theta. What is theta? Theta is the angle between the radial vector, that purple vector, and the momentum vector, which points in the same direction as the velocity vector, and that's that angle right there, and that angle is theta. That angle is 90 degrees. The sine of 90 degrees, if you look on your calculator or you know your sine curve, is one. So that means the angular momentum is just mv squared times r. Now, this is what Bohr came up with. He was trying to explain the emission spectrum of hydrogen. These are the Balmer series lines, the lines from the Balmer series. Red, and then it goes down here to blue, indigo, and violet. These are in the visible portion of the spectrum. And he was trying to figure out, or the question was, why do we only see these distinct lines in the emission spectrum? Why don't we see a continuous spectrum all the way from, of course, infrared, and then across the visible, and into the ultraviolet, and shorter and higher? And what he said, what he hypothesized, was that the angular momentum of the electron must be quantized. So there were distinct angular momenta. There wasn't a whole range of uh, an infinite number of momenta, and that they were quantized by 
a whole number n. And then you multiply that, he multiplied that times h, Planck's constant, divided by 2 pi. So they were quantized, I like to say, by this whole number n times h divided by 2 pi. All right? So that was kind of the breakthrough that he had for coming up with why we see these distinct emission spectrum lines. Now, we now have this term and this term, and they're equal to each other because we have MVR, that's the angular momentum. Bohr said it's quantized, and it's equal to this term, NH divided by 2 pi. So now we're going to solve this term, these two terms for V, and substitute them into here. So that means I get V is equal to NH, because it's N times H, divided by 2 pi, and then I have, uh, I'm solving for V, so I have M and R. I'm going to divide by M and R, and that gives me, in the denominator, 2 pi M R. Now I'm going to substitute that in here for V squared, and we got to remember to square everything, which we're going to do that on the next slide right now. Okay, we had K E squared R divided by M, no, time equals, excuse me, equals M times V squared. We know now, we now know that V can be used, can get, we can get from this term. I'm going to substitute in there and square everything. So now I get K E squared R, same thing on the left, and then I get n squared, because i got to square the n. I have m, because that's this m. I have h squared, because I have to square the h. I have 2 pi. i got to square both of those things. 2 squared is 4. Pi squared is pi squared. I'm going to m squared and r squared. All right. So those, that's that substitution. Now I can get rid of some r's again. I can get rid of the, some m's again. This M cancels with one of these. This R cancels with one of these R's. And I'm just left with KE squared is equal to N squared, H squared, divided by 4 pi squared, M R. This is the R we're going to solve for. And what I'm going to do is you can say you cross multiply or you multiply both sides of the equation by 4 pi squared M R. Yes. And then we can get uh, KE squared for pi squared mr, could be multiply across, and we're left with n and h squared on this side, and we want to solve for r, so I'm going to divide both sides of this equation by ke squared for pi squared m. Leave the r there, and you get that r is equal to n squared h squared ke squared for pi squared m. Now, on the next slide, we're just going to substitute the values in for all of those terms. Now, n squared, n is just 1, because we're trying to find the ground state, and the ground state is defined as 1. Right? n equals 1. The excited states would then be n equals 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. So this is n1, n1 squared is 1, or 1 squared is n, and then we have Planck's constant, 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 squared. Then we have Coulomb's constant, which is 9 times 10 to the ninth. Don't square that, but we square the elemental charge, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 squared, 4 pi squared, and then m, and we don't square the m's, it's just 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31. That's the mass of the electron in kilograms. If you do all of that, then you will get that r, the Bohr radius, is equal to 5.1, 5.1. 5.29 or 5.3 times 10 to the minus 11. Okay, so that is the Bohr radius. That's the radius for the ground state in the hydrogen atom. Now, if we want to find the radius for N2, the first excited state, N3, the second, and N4, you'll notice that this all of this equation will stay the same except for N. The only thing that's going to change is for the second, for the first excited state for N2, this will be 2. For the next one, this will be 3. And for the next one, this will be 4. So we can then write a more general form to find the radii for all of the radii, the ground state Bohr, and all the excited ones as R equals N squared. Because this stuff and this stuff stays the same. Coulomb's constant of the charge, mass of the electron, uh, 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 this constant here, um, Planck's constant here, all, is, all that stuff stays the same and will always be equal to 5.3 times 10 to the minus 11. We put 1 in here, we 1 squared, we get the same thing. Now on the next slide, then for, therefore, 
we can find the radii for the Bohr radius again and for the first three excited states. The Bohr radius, the ground state is n1, the first excited state is n2, so we squared 2 is 4, then we squared 3 because that's the second excited state is 3, n3, and then for the third excited state, that's n4, and we square 4. So for the first one, we get the same one, same value, 5.3 times 10 to the minus 11. 4 times that, 2 squared times that is equal to 2.1 times 10 to the minus 10. And then we have the value for n3 and the value for n4. All right, so that is how you can find the Bohr radius, or how we came up with the Bohr radius, and then how you can use the Bohr radius <coughs> excuse me, to come up with the radii for the excited states in a hydrogen atom. Okay, thank you very much for watching. I hope you found the video helpful. If you did, please do all the following four things. Subscribe to my channel, get all my excellent physics, chemistry, and math videos. Please, helps me out, promotes my videos and my channel. Give me a thumbs up and leave me a comment. And don't forget, sharing is caring. Share this video with all of your friends. Show them just how much you care. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you in the next video.